Hi, welcome to Existential Psychology once again here at the University of West Georgia. Hope you're enjoying your corona apocalypse and the resulting quarantine. At any rate, let's connect up with where we were in the last video in this series, which is about Jean-Paul Sartre. In the last video, we were looking at Sartre's idea of bad faith. And that's his answer to the question of what is the main thing we do with our fundamental existential freedom and responsibility? And his answer in terms of bad faith is that the main thing we do is run from it. How do we do that? Well, in a, any number of different ways, by making excuses for ourselves, by seeing ourselves as beings that are somehow determined that have to be a particular way when in reality we are choosing to be the way we are. Uh, so let's pick up on that note. One of the ways that we engage in bad faith is by seeing ourselves in terms of a kind of determinism, that basically we're determined in who and what we are. What might be one way of doing that? Well, to follow in parallel with your notes, uh, one common way of doing that is to think of ourselves in terms of the construct of personality. Most of the time, what we mean by personality is that there's a particular way that we are and that we just have to be that way, quite apart from anything that we would choose. That basically we're determined in one way or another by whatever our personality happens to be. Now, there are different ways of thinking about personality from the point of view of psychology. They're, one of the main ways of thinking about it is in terms of what's called trait theory, that ultimately what we think of as our personality is composed of some number of traits, and depending upon the particular theory, the number of fundamental personality traits varies. Probably the most common trait theory and the most familiar trait theory is the big five trait theory. So our personalities are ultimately uh, a combination of five different factors, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So those are the five basic uh, categories according to the big five trait personality theory. But there are other theories. There's the 16PF theory. That stands for 16 personality factor theory. And uh, according to that theory, obviously, I think, uh, there are 16 fundamental dimensions. So how we see personality can vary quite a bit depending upon the particular theory we ascribe to. But let's look at the factor of extroversion and introversion. And the reason why I'm picking that one out is because it's common to pretty much every trait theory. Oh, pretty much every trait theory has a factor that has to do with extroversion on one hand and introversion on the other hand. The big five, obviously, as I mentioned, that's one of the big five factors there. It's also in the 16PF and other personality theories too. So extroversion and introversion. And probably most of us have a particular way of thinking about ourselves along that dimension, either more toward the extroverted side or more toward the introverted side, or maybe you think you're right smack in the middle of the two. Um, but at any rate, is it really the case that in terms of introversion and extroversion, you simply have to be a certain way and you can't deviate from that as a function of your freedom? And at first, the answer to that question might seem to be, yeah, that's, that's really the case. Like, I'm either an extrovert or an introvert, or maybe you're a 50-50 kind of person right in the middle somewhere, and that you couldn't just deviate. Is that really true, though? Because I bet that if you decided that you were going to make a practice, and yeah, it may take a little bit of practice and a little bit of working with it for you to see that if you were to... to uh, um, Let's say you uh, think of yourself as an introvert, which is how I think of myself, that uh, one way of thinking of introversion is that your interior world feels bigger than the exterior world. You're bigger on the inside, to put it in the words of Doctor Who. So uh, if you're that way, kind of a weird sort of connection, but what the hell. Hey, coronavirus apocalypse. I'm going to write all my mistakes and weird things off to that. Okay, so um, that would be an instance of bad faith too, by the way, because in reality I'd be choosing to do stuff like that. But, um, okay, so let's say you think of yourself as an introvert. Is it really the case that if you put your mind to it and you made a practice out of it, that you couldn't develop a more extroverted side to yourself and ultimately be more extroverted? 
And I think the answer is, well, yeah, of course you could always do that. For instance, for myself, um, for a while, I took up the practice of doing stand-up comedy, which is a really strange thing for a person who thinks of himself as basically an introvert like I do. So uh, stand-up comedy means uh, going into bars with lots of drunken people and uh, standing in front of them with a microphone and a spotlight and trying to deliver some kind of comedy. Um, uh, so that's kind of an odd thing for an introverted person to do, but what I discovered in doing that, and I did a whole bunch of shows and a whole bunch of routines and so on, and I actually managed a comedy show for a while too, uh, is that uh, what you can discover in that is that, well, you could develop your extroverted side if you put your mind to it, and yeah, okay, it takes some practice because probably you're in the habit of being introverted, let's say, or it works the other way around. Like if you're naturally extroverted, could you sort of make a practice out of being more reserved and living more toward your interiority rather than your exteriority? And I think the answer there too is, well, yeah, if you decided to, you could practice it and after a while you'd get better at it and eventually it'd become natural for you. So, and the same is true of other things. Let's look at the big five factors. Okay, so let's say you're conscientious, like you're a highly conscientious person, which means that you like things to be ordered and uh, have routines and stuff like that. Well, if you decided to and you could make a practice out of ha living a less ordered life, could you possibly do that? And after a while, I bet you would discover that you could and so on. Well, if all that's true, then isn't what we think of as personality, the way we typically think of personality, something of an illusion? There's something illusory about that because normally when we think of personality, we think of it in terms of basically a bad faith kind of thing, like just a way you have to be that is not subject to your freedom, that you couldn't be otherwise. That's just the way you are. And the deeper truth is, if you think about it, that that's not actually true at all. That you could, any way, any sort of factor that would make up your personality if you decided to uh, emphasize the other, the opposite of that, whatever that factor happens to be, you could cultivate that and you could change your personality. So uh, one way, so then w the point is like, what is the normal way we think of personality about? Well, from the point of view of Sartre's analysis, it's about an exercise in bad faith. It's a way of deluding ourselves, in essence, about what we really are and how free re we really are by entertaining the fantasy that we just have to be a certain kind of person, case closed. But that's not actually honest. That's a form of theater. That's a way of making excuses for ourselves. In short, it's bad faith. Okay, so next sort of element of our lives, next way we practice bad faith, emotions. The emotions, well, you know, the emotions is um, one way of thinking about it is it's, it's a sort of subset of our personality that part of what makes you have the personality that you seem to have is that you're, you express certain kinds of emotions more easily or more often than other kinds of emotions. Well, what about emotions? Well, the way we typically think about emotions is that emotions are our way of reacting to whatever the situation happens to be. For instance, if we, uh, if we go somewhere and someone says, F you to us, we think, well, I just got to be mad. And it's like, well, really, you're that much of a damn puppet that if someone says a certain kind of word to you or uses a certain kind of phrase to you, that you have no choice in your emotional reaction but to get angry or whatever, get depressed, get happy. It doesn't really matter what the emotional response is. But let's use anger because maybe that's a little bit more accessible. So if someone says something to you, you really have no choice but to get angry because I bet the deeper reality is that you could decide whether or not you're going to get angry when someone says F you to you. Like you're actually freer than you normally like to think, or and maybe not you personally, but how we normally like to think of ourselves. That, well, uh, people just make, does anyone just make you angry ever? The way that phrase would literally mean. Does anyone just make you, like force you to be angry quite apart from your ongoing practice of freedom. Could you decide that the thing that maybe habitually makes you angry isn't going to make you angry this time? Are you free enough to decide a different emotional response to whatever emotional situation you happen to be in? Once again, I would say that, okay, maybe because of force of habit, it would take a little bit of practice for you to do that. 
Like you'd have to perhaps make a project out of it and sort of practice. Like if you're a musician learning a song, usually you need to practice that song a whole bunch of times, like let's say a hundred times in order to get good at that song. So, well, your emotional responses might work the same way. You might need to practice, but I bet that if you decided to, you could change your typical emotional responses to things. I bet if you feel like you have to get angry when someone says F you to you, you could make a project out of laying claim to your actual emotional freedom. Like maybe you're more powerful than you think you are. Maybe you're more free than you think you are. Or that maybe you're more free than society wants you to be. You know, because probably our prevailing practices which make it seem like, well, you just have to be a certain kind of person with a certain kind of personality. And you just have to be a certain kind of, uh, you know, basically emotional robot so that if certain kinds of things happen, your emotional response is already dictated ahead of time. You're basically just like a puppet dancing on a string. So if someone says something nice to you, you can be happy. Oh, a happy puppet. You're just a happy damn puppet. And then if someone says something mean to you, you're like an angry, nasty puppet. You're the kind of puppet that wakes up in the middle of the night with a kitchen knife in your fist. Well, maybe that's all about... I'm trying to make it seem absurd. That's why, you know, like, well, has the professor gone psychotic? No, I went psychotic a long time ago. Right now, I'm trying to make a point. And the point is, the absurdity of our way of thinking about things like emotions and like personalities, which makes it seem like we're far less free and far less responsible for how we react to the world than we actually are. Okay, so that's Sartre's point. Let's continue on with this analysis, because the point of this whole lecture is to go through a bunch of these examples so that you eventually, by the end of this lecture, hopefully, you're going to get a sense for what I described in the previous video, which was, previous videos over there, is, which is the, uh, the nauseating quality of our existential freedom, that there's something dizzying and disorienting about it. So I'm trying to sort of take apart a whole bunch of ways that we have a typically, typically thinking about our lives so that uh, you get a sense for how free you really are and how nauseating that freedom really is. So, okay, next one. How about the roles that you play? And here, uh, Sartre's famous example is the role of a waiter. So he's sitting around these cafes in Paris uh, thinking of this stuff and drinking lattes or whatever and uh, smoking cigarettes and uh, he's observing waiters as they go around and the particular uh, sort of uh, theatrical displays waiters would put on. That's probably perhaps more common in France than it is in the United States. But he's thinking about uh, how people uh, take up their roles is what it is. So the reason why he's talking about a waiter is what he's really trying to get at is the roles that we think of ourselves in terms of. Now in English, uh, I think the linguistic conventions that are common to this sort of thing are really indicative of the point Sartre is trying to make. So when we say, I am a professor, or I am a student, or I am a waiter, or I am a bricklayer, it doesn't matter what the role actually is. What I'm trying to get at is the I am a blank. Okay, so you fill in the blank. So let's say uh, you're a student, because most of you watching these videos are my students. So like, well, I am a student and uh, the strangeness of that statement goes something like this. Is that really true that that is something you are? Okay. Or is it more true to say that that's a particular role that you have for now? Because the way we talk about it makes it seem like when you say, I am a student, well, that makes it seem like, well, that role has somehow determined your being. If that's what you are, then what you are is defined by that. And that's not really the case, is it? Because the fact of the matter is your freedom undercuts that in a pretty big way. Because at any and all points, you could decide you're not going to be a student anymore. At any and all points, I could decide I'm not going to be a professor anymore. You know, And the same is true of all of the so-called roles that we think define who and what we are such that we end up saying things like, I am a professor or a teacher or whatever it happens to be, you know? Well, actually, none of those is true because that's not something you are. That's something you've chosen. 
You've chosen at some level to be a student. In the last video, we talked about how most of our choices are pre-reflective and probably, well, possibly, you've chosen to be a student in a pre-reflective way without really thinking about it too hard. But insofar as there were other options for you, insofar as even this semester, you could decide you're going to fail out and discontinue being a student, and who knows what you'll decide to do, you know, like if you decide to go down that road, probably other things will open up for you. But the way we talk about our roles as though we were de they were determinative of our very existence is another element of bad faith. It's another bad faith exercise, another way of disowning our fundamental freedom by engaging in a kind of theater that makes it seem like we're purely determined by the fact that I am a professor. I am a pro That's not something I am. I am not a professor, if you're sort of following the analysis here. Now, being a professor is not something that I am, because there's always other options. At any and all points, I could discontinue being a professor. Well, if, if that's true, then being a professor is not something I am. It's just a choice that I make, and I have been continually remaking for the last 25 years or so. You getting it? So the trick is, it's not something I am, it's something that I'm choosing. But the fact is that we cover over that choice with our prevailing linguistic conventions. Okay, so at this point, okay, so let's summarize for a second. So you're not determined by the person you think you have to be, let's say in terms of personality. You're not determined by your emotional reactions at any point in time or your characteristic emotional reactions. And Finally, you're not determined by what seem to be your roles or your job or your hobbies or anything like that. Because all of those things, how you feel is a product of your choices. The person you are is the product of your choices. The role that you decide you're going to play today, whether it's waiter or <laughs> anything else, is a product of your choices. Okay, so that's a way of summarizing. Now let's let's go down one layer further. Well, a, another way that we engage in bad faith is by saying, uh, well, uh, yeah, okay, so I'm free. I'm free to pick, but um, I free to I'm free to pick what I want. You getting it? So so the next layer of bad faith is to say that well, our choices are determined by our desires, by what we think we want. All right, so you go into the supermarket and there, there are five different kinds of, uh, let's say toilet paper, because we're talking about this in the midst of the corona virus. Like I've been to the store a bunch of times when there was absolutely no toilet paper, but let's say a month or so ago, you went to the supermarket and there were, well, there's more than five kinds, but let's just say five kinds of toilet paper. And so, uh, uh, well, Charmin is uh, squeezably soft you know, but then there's Scott, which is the most, I guess, efficient one. And so you, you, uh, you decide uh, which toilet paper you're going to pick. And the fiction that you tell yourself is that you're choosing what you want, as though your choice was completely determined by your desire. Okay, so that's why in your notes I'm talking about it in terms of preference. Maybe I should shift the example to pizza because that's what's in your notes. I picked that for your notes because that's a college food and college students and myself too. I still love college food even though I'm a lot older now. Oh my goodness, my bit defender thing just popped up and needs to be shut down. Okay, so pepperoni pizza you say you like you, you pick pepperoni pizza because you say you like pepperonis and if I were to ask you why do you like pepperonis it's like well they're sort of meaty and spicy and kind of greasy and bad for me and all that kind of stuff but what you're basically saying is that your choices are predetermined by what you want or what you desire or what you prefer at some level well the thing is like if you look at what constitutes your preferences is could that be could you decide you're going to prefer something else like for me personally, the most difficult kind of pizza to like in this regard would probably be anchovy. Some pe for some people, it's like uh, pineapple pizza. I actually like pineapple pizza. Uh, for me, sort of the biggest challenge would be um, uh, anchovy pizza. Anchovies are sort of these really 
uh, pretty spicy, <laughs> not spicy, but a sort of a strong tasting fish that they put in pizza sometimes, and that's a difficult thing. So when I ask myself, well, am I really picking a pepperoni pizza over anchovies because I like it and my likes and my desires are determining my choice for me? In other words, like, is it possible for me to pick a anchovy pizza, which I would say I would do not like, and eat it, and the obvious answer is probably, well, yeah, of course, I could always pick something I don't like and eat it. You know, well, okay, so next level. Um, is it possible for me to develop a taste for anchovy pizzas? You know, sometimes they, they call this an acquired taste. Like some tastes in life are acquired tastes. Like you have to try it a whole bunch of times, and at first you're probably not going to like it. But if you stay with it long enough, you can actually develop a liking for something that you dislike at first. Well, you know, could I possibly develop a taste for anchovy pizzas? And I think the obvious answer is yeah. You know, the fact of the matter is I could develop a, a uh, acquired taste for a whole lot of different things if I just once again put my mind to it. And so in other words, what's the point here? The point is um, that what seems to determine your freedom ahead of time in terms of your preferences and your desires and what it is you think you want and what it is you think you like, actually those things are a function of your freedom too. Because if you put your mind to it, you could decide that you're going to like something that you initially disliked, or if you put your mind to it, that you could dislike something that you initially liked. Okay, so it can work the other way around too. Like if you made a practice out of it, you could learn. You could probably learn to dislike pepperoni pizzas. Like you could uh, sort of in your mind associate them with other things that you you dislike, and so on and so forth. So uh, the point is that your preferences don't determine your choices either. So the logic of well, I'm free to pick what I want. That itself is a kind of bad faith. You getting it? So we're adding sort of a fourth layer to this analysis. So your preferences don't determine your freedom either. Your desires don't determine your freedom either because you can always choose against your desire or against your preferences. A little bit like Dostoevsky's idea of choosing one's most advantageous advantage. Notice how these sort of lines are beginning to intersect through these different existential thinkers. So we have a point of intersection here between Sartre and Dostoevsky. Okay, so at this point, what I want to do is try to bring you into that a, uh, a kind of experience if I can. This is going to be difficult. This is the toughest part. Okay, so let's sort of review. Like if you don't have to be a particular kind of person, if the particular kind of person you are is shot through with your choices, with, you can always choose to be a different kind of person. Like if your characteristic emotions are the same kind of thing, like you could decide that you're going to have a different set of emotional responses to things, both in terms of individual instances and in terms of your habitual emotional responses. If, let's see, what's the next thing? If your roles, your roles, you could decide that you're going to take up a different role. The fact of the matter is that even if you're a student, let's say hypothetically you're a student at West Georgia, okay? I know, it's a stretch, but hang with me, come on. Um, what is keeping you at each and every point in your life from dropping your classes, buying a plane ticket to India, and wandering the streets of Calcutta as a mendicant beggar in a saffron robe? Actually, what's keeping you from doing that other than your ongoing choice? Because the thing about buying plane tickets, especially in our age, is it's not exactly rocket science, now is it? thing about buying saffron robes is it's real easy now that we have um, eBay and Amazon.com and access to the internet. You could probably even get like a very special begging bowl for you to wander around in and collect food if you want to sort of do that. And In other words, what's keeping you from doing something really radically different from your life other than the role that you think you simply have to fulfill? Other than you? And I think the answer is well, really nothing. And you may think, well, you know, yeah, but social customs, like, determine me. Really? Because I bet at each and every point you could decide you're going to defy social customs, that those don't really determine you. That's an illusion, too. Okay, so, <laughs> at this point, uh, the question is, what is it that determines you and the quality of your life, other than your ongoing practice of freedom? All right, because... The thing is that 
whatever there is that would seem to determine you, you have to decide to regard it as something that determines you. Okay? So if you say, well, you know, God determines me, it's like, ah, but isn't it true that you have to decide to see things that way, that God is determining you in order for it to seem true in the first place? In other words, your practice of freedom is more fundamental than God determining you. The same game you could play with respect to scientific principles. You could say, well, I'm just sort of a manifestation of various abstract scientific principles, you know, uh, running throughout the cosmos that are coalescing in the form of my neurological reality, my biological reality, which itself is part and parcel of sort of the large social matrix in which I live, and so on, and that all of that determines me through and through. Well, actually, you could decide at each and every point to see yourself in a radically different way. It's not that all of that determines you. What's really going on is that you're choosing to see it as though it determines you. The real reality is your ongoing practice of freedom, and you could always decide you're going to see things in a different way. Now, the other side of that coin is, at the same time, you would be responsible for however it is you would decide to see things differently, for whatever the outcome of that would be, but the fact of the matter is each, each and every point you could decide to see things differently. So, what this is adding up to, ultimately, is there is no basis for your choice other than what you choose to regard as a basis for your choice. You getting it? In other words, the real thing that's going on is that we're awash in this totally directionless ocean of choices, that that's really what our lives are about at a, at a fundamental level. Sure, we try to escape that reality. We try to pretend like that's not true. And we do that in a whole bunch of tricky ways. Things like personality, things like our roles, things like our emotional reactions, and so on. And there are many, many more of these kinds of practices. We love to make excuses for ourselves, but the fact is that all that we are is a product of our ongoing choices in a particular way. And one of the main choices we make is to choose to pretend like that's not true. Well, suppose you were to pretend that the opposite of that were true. Okay? Suppose you were to say, well, you know, maybe after reading some Sartre, like maybe like what my life really is, is nothing other than assembl an assemblage, a massive assemblage of ongoing choices, most of which we make pre-reflectively, let's not forget that, but the, you, at each and every point you could become aware of how you typically do that and lay claim to the actual reality of your freedom and responsibility, and who knows, maybe end up living a very different life than the one you think you're just programmed. You're just sort of like uh, in this, in this uh, niche, like you're sort of in this sort of robotic computer program that you just have to live out. Well, maybe that's a choice too. Yeah, you could see your life that way, but why would you want to is the interesting question, right? Now here, why would you want to see things that way? Certainly power would want you to see things that way. You know, power always wants you not to recognize how free and ultimately powerful you really are. Because it's not in power's interest for you to realize your freedom. It's in power's interest for you to think of yourself as a predictable kind of slave. You know, because that's what keeps you doing your damn job, keeps you predictable, and keeps you controllable. So, one answer would be, well, you know, power doesn't want me to lay claim to my freedom, so I won't. <sighs> really? Really, that's your answer. So you're going to do whatever power tells you to do, because that's the same answer that the guards at Auschwitz had. Okay, that was their answer to the enigma of life. The Fuhr principle, they called it. They're just going to do whatever the Fuhr says, and that's like case closed. And it's like, well, you know, maybe you're deeper than that. Maybe you don't have to be a figurative guard at Auschwitz in your life. Maybe there's a deeper paradigm for your entire existence than that particular one. Just a thought. Okay, so I don't think that obeying the dictates of power is necessarily uh, the best paradigm for your or anyone else's life. But that might just... Okay, I'm a little bit of a rebel, I'll own that. So, you know, so <laughs> maybe they should have rebellion as like the next uh, personality factor thing. All right, so, uh, and on and on. Okay, so... All you are is an assemblage of your choices. That's all your life is, is your choices. So, uh, 
I tried to say it in your notes in the most ironic way possible because the way of complaining about this vision of like, well, damn, you know, if all I am is my choices, then I guess I'm responsible for my life. If your life has high quality, you're responsible for that. If you're living out a life that seems miserable and seems to be a low quality life, well, you're responsible for that. Like all reality inheres in action. And here I'm quoting Sartre. Okay, so <laughs> once again, camera just went off to remind me that, hey, you need, dude, you need to sort of close this video out because it's starting to get a little bit too long. So, okay, what's the main point of this lecture? The main point is to give you a sense for how ultimately directionless our existence really is. Because if all of our life adds up to our ongoing choices and our responsibility for our choices, and um, if that's really true, and if anything that would seem to provide a direction or guidance for all of that, we have to regard, we have to choose to regard as a source of direction and guidance, then all we really are is just ongoing freedom. And that that's a very uh, dizzying, oh my goodness, nauseating. You know, Sartre wrote a famous book, uh, a novel, uh, in addition to being in nothingness called nausea or nausea in English, um, uh, which is more or less about this, you know, like about how nauseating existence really is. And that sense of nausea and disorientation and dizzyingness, the fact that you could stop your entire life right now and pick up a very different one with a different personality, a different set of emotional reactions. You could change your geographic location. You can change what your project is. You can change what you're about as a human being and so on and so forth. You could change your roles, etc. Like all of those things and more are nothing but what you're deciding. Nothing but what you're deciding. That that's ultimately what we are. And so we're left in this, this really disorienting, trackless, undulating, Oh, almost getting seasick, nauseating ocean of freedom and responsibility. And that's a big reason why we engage in bad faith. Because it's hard for us to sustain that amount of dizziness in our existence. It's hard for us to be that honest. Because when we're that honest, we have to learn to endure a certain amount of disorientation in our lives. So, in the next video, we're going to be looking at another big thing that motivates bad faith, and that's going to be responsibility. So we're going to sort of look at the other side of the coin now. But until then, I hope you have a great day. I hope you're enjoying your corona quarantine as much as you possibly can. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Take care.